Så, och min nästa gäst är då professor James Vopel som är professor vid Max Planck Institute for Democratic Research in Rostock. Welcome professor Vopel. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for a, a splendid keynote earlier today here at Forty Talks. Thank you very much. Well, quite interesting. What are your impressions so far of the conference? Oh, it's very interesting. I, I enjoyed the second talk very much and the third talk as well. I thought there were some good questions. The, the moderator is very good. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. Yes, very good. Uh, well, you're talking about that we have to, to adjust or change the way we look at work situations mm -hmm. uh, when the, the, uh, uh, the people are getting older and older yeah. and, and uh, so on. Uh, uh, that makes a couple of challenges, doesn't mm -hmm. it? How to society to adjust to people working yeah. longer, mm -hmm. living longer, and mm -hmm. so on. What are the main challenges as you see it? Well, the, the, the situation is that right now, uh, life expectancy in Sweden is in the low 80s, but life expectancy is continuing to go up, so that most of our children will live past age 100. So there has to be some transition between the current situation where people live 80 or 90 years and the future situation where people will live more than 100 years. And what that means is that I think that people are going to want to and they're going to have to work more years of their life because they're living longer, but as compensation they can work fewer hours per week. So we spread work out more evenly over longer lives. Yeah, and I guess this, is, this is, isn't something that will happen in one's uh, just take a decision on a governmental level to do that. It no, will take it a couple of years. It can be course. done very gradually. The, the, uh, the can, policies can be put into effect that gradually lengthen the uh, work life and gradually reduce the number of hours worked per week. We're, we're talking about developments that are going to take place over the next hundred years. So, mm -hmm. so it doesn't have to be done tomorrow. It, it can be gradually implemented over decades. Yeah. The, and the best uh, policies will be policy similar to Sweden's current pension policy where their automatic adjustments are, are made depending on how much longer people live and depending on how much money is available for pensions. Mm. Denmark, in Denmark people are beginning to discuss an interesting new idea which is that the age at which uh, people ordinarily retire, the, the, the normal age of retirement, will be life expectancy minus 17. Yeah. So if, if people live 82 years on average then 65. If people live 92 years on average, then 75. And this can take place gradually. It doesn't, won't take place immediately, but it will be spread out as progress is made. But, but I guess society has to do some, some adjustments, adjustments yeah. to it. What, what do you see are the big challenges for yeah, society there, to adjust? Yeah, there's several big challenges. First of all, there has to be more part-time work. Because older people, many older people would like to work, but not full-time. They might want to work half-time. So there have to be opportunities like that that are opened up. The same thing is true for younger people, that uh, younger couples might both want to work part-time instead of one person working full-time and the other person working not at all or, or much less. So, so more provision of part-time work. Secondly, the, the um, attitudes have to be changed, policies have to be changed to allow older people to work longer if they want to. In Denmark now, there's no mandatory retirement for people like me, so I can keep on working as a university professor as long as I'm able to do so. In Sweden, even today, professors ordinarily retire at 65. They, they have to give up leadership responsibilities at 65. They can't continue to work later. So it needs to be more flexibility so that people are allowed to work longer if they'd like to work longer. And people who want to work longer, there should be incentives to work longer. So if you do work longer, then you should get a bigger pension when you finally do retire. Because you're not using the pension now, but you're working longer, you're contributing to taxes, so you should be rewarded by, by getting a, a larger mm -hmm. monthly paycheck when you do retire. Mm -hmm. you, you concluded that, you said that during your, your keynote here, the 68 is the new 57. I yeah, think yeah, yeah. This is a pretty, pretty good describing of the yeah. situation of how we're getting healthier and, yeah. and, and, and we're living longer and so on. But do you see it as specific challenges due to what kind of work? I mean, you have a couple of uh, physically demanding uh, yeah. uh, works or, or occupational stuff. Is it possible to see that some, uh, some people won't be able to do that? Oh, we'll certainly. Th there are some people who have had very demanding jobs, a lot of requiring a lot of physical effort since they were 15 or 16 or 18 years old. And s some of these people will not be able to work longer. They'll be worn out from hard work, certainly. And other people will have gotten sick from some disease. They might have gotten a heart attack. They might have gotten some kind of cancer. And uh, they might suffer from diabetes or some other illness. And they will not be able to work as long as healthy people. So, so there has to be flexibility that people who can work 
should be allowed to work, should be encouraged to work. The people who can't work should be uh, given enough money to live in, in, in a fair manner. Mm. Uh, it might be, uh, of course, this will take a, a couple of, uh, maybe up to 100 years to yeah. until we see this kind of shift. But, but still, uh, at present, uh, there are discussions in Sweden and I know in other countries mm -hmm. too that actually going the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, that we, we, uh, we, we want to work uh, less longer yeah. uh, because we've been expecting now to have our re re yeah. retirement or 65 yeah. or so on. Uh, it's, it's, it will be, I guess, a quite a pedagogical uh, challenge or yeah. to, to so, so make this the, happen. The, uh, in the short term, somebody who's close to retirement age might like to retire today instead of tomorrow. And I can see the people in there late 50s or early 60s would be in favor of early retirement age. But my, my personal feeling is that this is fundamentally unfair to younger people. That, that it, when older people retire earlier, younger people have to pay higher taxes. Somebody has to pay the pensions. Mm. And uh, put it, by putting more burden on younger people, you're making it difficult, more difficult for younger people to take care of children and to continue their educations, to advance their careers. So I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's really, Socially, uh, older people should be more, should show more solidarity with younger people. Older people should be willing to help younger people more. Now, older people do help younger people in many ways. They take, help take care of grandchildren. They, they sometimes help uh, younger people financially. But, but uh, I think older people should help even more. They should work. And, and, uh, and this would take off, this would eliminate a big burden on younger people. So, so we're not uh, only then working in an older age than we are today, and we'll say in a hundred years, but, but younger people would work less. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it, uh, this might demand from us a more, uh, almost, a, a f it might be a philosophical is issue, yeah. how we look at work, how we look at spare time, mm -hmm. leisure time, and so on. Uh, will, will there be a sort of a, a philosophical revolution to, to be able to, to manage this? Yeah. The the point of the matter, as I pointed out in my talk, is that we work remarkably little. That, that if you take the whole population of Sweden or Denmark, which is an example I use, people only are working about 13 hours per week on average. It's, it's just that the work is very unevenly spread out, so that some people are working very hard and a lot of people are not working at all. If we could redistribute work so that more people were working, but they were working fewer hours per week, then we could uh, have a more even mix of education over the life course so that older people could get continuing education so they could continue to be productive and understand modern society. And we could spread leisure out more over the life course. So instead of having decades of leisure when you're 65, to spread this free time out over your whole life so that you can uh, enjoy your friends and your family more when you're younger, so you can play tennis or golf or whatever you like to do, so you can read books more when you're younger. And I think it's just uh, makes much more sense instead of having a block of time when you get educated and a block of time when you work and have children and a block of time when you don't have anything to do, that we, we spread it out more evenly. Mm. And it, but it will require a change in people's attitudes. That's, that's it, sure. it does. Yeah. Uh, f frankly, for a personal view, I have to say that since I'm a father of uh, a pair of six-year-old twins, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah why not? Uh, I would like some less time yeah. working at, at, at uh, this age, at least. Yeah, sure. Uh, how, how does this correspond, cor cor correspond with an article you published in Nature in January uh, uh, with the title Diversity of Aging Across the Tree of Life? Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about yeah, so, that? So uh, I uh, am interested in public policy issues, but I'm not a politician, I'm not a policy analyst. I'm mainly a, a basic researcher. And so one line of the basic research that we do is to try to understand fundamental patterns of aging. And to understand fundamental patterns of aging, we're looking at many different species. We're looking at other primates like baboons and chimpanzees, but we're looking at other mammals like lions and tigers and bears and so on. And we're looking at... Uh, birds and fish and reptiles, and we're also looking at insects and, and we're looking at plants uh, and trying to see are there some fundamental relationships uh, that govern aging across the whole tree of life. Because after all, we're animals and we share many of our uh, physical characteristics with other animals. So, so can we learn something about aging by looking at other species? And w the deeper motivation is can we learn how to live longer, healthier by studying other species? So that's the that was the uh, point of this line of research. Uh, what are your conclusions? Yeah, the, the, the most, I think the most interesting thing we discovered was that uh, we, had, we have data for humans when they were uh, 
under the conditions where humans lived thousands of years ago. We have this data from what are people who are called hunter-gatherers, people who are alive today in Africa or uh, New Guinea or uh, Paraguay, who are living the same kind of lives, hunting and gathering fruits and vegetables that we humans used to live thousands of years ago. So we have information about what their lives are like and then how long they lived and what happens to mortality over the course of life, what happens to illness over the course of life. And then we have data on Swedes uh, in the 19th century, and then we have data on Swedes today. And, uh, and we see a progression from the hunter-gatherers to the Swedes 100 years ago to the Swedes today. And the, the, uh, what you see is a, a steady increase in life expectancy, but also a, a steady sharpening of the uh, curve that governs the risk of death. So modern Swedes have a very low chance of death before they get to be 65 or 70, and then the chance of death goes up, it goes up very, very sharply at the end of life. Whereas the hunter-gatherers, the chance of death was much more spread out. And then we compared the hunter-gatherers to baboons and to other primates, and the, if you look at the pattern of mortality and you look at life expectancy, the hunter-gatherers were actually closer to the primates, the chimpanzees, mm -hmm. than they are to us today. So but genetically, of course, the hunter-gatherers and we, we're the same genetically, more sure. or less. There's not been very much genetic change. So what that means is that social change has resulted in an, has resulted in an enormous increase in life expectancy, an enormous increase in health. It's not been genetic change, it's been social change. Right. And this is really very interesting. The, the other thing we discovered was that humans are extreme outliers, especially modern humans, so that uh, we thought when we started the study we might find humans in the middle of other species someplace. But no, no, no. Humans have the sharpest increase of mortality with age and the longest life expectancies uh, of most species. Uh, there are some trees that live longer than us and some other uh, animals that live longer than us. But humans have very long life expectancies for our size and, the, and a very sharp increase in mortality with age. All right. We are so looking forward to hear more about that later on. I guess yeah. we've got some more results coming up from yeah. the study. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, Professor. you're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you.